Well, hello and welcome to this week's Bible study. Uh, let's, let's begin, as we always do, with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for the beauty of the life we've been given, the, the wonderful opportunities to enjoy freedom and to enjoy the, the good things that you bless us with. But the most important thing that we've blessed us with is the opportunity to be your children. And as we study and try to understand more clearly, we pray that you'll bless us. Forgive us when we fail you. Bless our study this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, again, welcome to, our, welcome to our study this week. Uh, last week we began uh, working through the 11th chapter of, uh, of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we will continue that today. Uh, what We, we kind of got through the first half of the book, uh, which was, I guess you would say, from verses 1 through about verse 16. It had to do with coverings uh, on the head, uh, lots of different interpretations of that down through the years, specifically uh, those who would say that that was meaning a veil or a hat of some kind. Uh, as we worked through it, we kind of came to the conclusion that the reference there, because of what Paul said specifically in verses 14 and 15, it was hair that he was referencing, uh, the covering being uh, a blessing for a woman and men having uh, longer hair was, un was inappropriate. So interesting piece of scripture there as we try to work and understand, again, the challenges of, of cultural versus biblical are, are sometimes difficult. Uh, and this one kind of had a little bit of both. We then kind of kind of came to the second part of the book, and, and we started it and worked through a little bit of it last week. And this is a piece of scripture, and it's it's verses 17 uh, through the end of the chapter, verse 34. It's a piece of scripture that deals with an event that had kind of crept its way in the early church and become somewhat, it would be, it would appear from what, what is inferred, it became somewhat a part of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and it was in, when, when you step back and look at it, it was really a, a, a neat thing that was happening, but it had become abused by the, by the, uh, by the Corinthian church and possibly by other churches. And Paul is effectively going to put a stop to it here in this particular chapter. It's referred to as, as the agape feast or the love feast. And in all actuality, all it is uh, is quite simply a common meal. Uh, they, were, they were kind of enjoining uh, the Lord's Supper uh, with, with a time to, to eat. Uh, and, and certainly probably when that began, it was, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, Christians were sharing, Christians were, work, were, were together in a, in a meal, and then it would culminate with their observance of the Lord's Supper. Really, really a, a special opportunity. But unfortunately, as with so many things, as this thing evolved, it suddenly became about groups doing one thing, the rich doing one thing, the poor not having any food, others drinking excessively, uh, just, just a bunch of abuses of it. And Paul is in the process of, 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 like I say, effectively, and we'll get down that in verse, uh, the last verse in, in chapter 11, verse 34, where he will effectively put a, put a stop to uh, the, uh, the agape feast uh, for all of time. And, and to, to, the, to this date, we still don't have anything like that in the Lord's church. Uh, we got down to, we started at verse 17, and we got down to about verse 22. At verse 23, an interesting thing happens. Paul, Paul kind of takes uh, a, a little offshoot to a, a, a teaching that has become something that's extraordinarily important for us in our understanding of the Lord's Supper in general. Uh, and it's, I think in my mind, without question, the most comprehensive uh, teaching of the Lord's Supper that we have in the New Testament. Of course, we have the historical views that we get in, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John uh, teaches in John chapter 6 a little bit different uh, uh, theology uh, about, uh, about the Lord's Supper that Jesus gave when he was uh, early in his, in his, in his ministry. Uh, but it, when we get to this 1 Corinthians 11, this is a piece of scripture that's, that's really used quite frequently in our worship services. People kind of talk about the Lord's Supper and kind of give some insight uh, about the Lord's Supper. So it's a very familiar verse. Uh, 
and and one that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna kind of talk through as we as we get again. The the interesting thing to me about this is how this very important teaching about the Lord's Supper is really very much encapsulated in this larger teaching of Paul doing away with the uh, with the agape feast. Uh, uh, kind of interesting how he kind of encapsulated this particular teaching in the in the in the more in the more pronounced. Uh, teaching, which was somewhat negative uh, as far as, you know, having to do away with something and kind of scolding the church for the way that they've been abusing it. Uh, but again, for us as Christians, it's it's just so very important for us to understand the Lord's Supper. So let's work. Uh, and I, I guess so, sometimes you might call this a bit of a rabbit trail. He's teaching about something and he's going to go down here and give us some uh, teaching and then he will come back to it here in a little while. So let's begin at verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, and again, keep in mind from verse 17 through 22, uh, he had been giving a teaching uh, that was very, very negative. I don't, I don't know if negative is the right word, but it's, it's very pointed in his, in his, in his uh, uh, criticism of the way that the, the church there in Corinth has abused the, the love feast or the agape feast. So now he's going to kind of, again, take this uh, foray into the uh, end of the Lord's Supper. So in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. Very familiar story from the Gospels. Uh, again, we have the, the story recorded in all three of the verse three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, regarding going into the upper room, how they got there, how it was all set up, just a lot of miraculous events that, that occurred to, to actually get that to happen. Uh, and then... At, at some point in the supper, and it was it was in a, it wasn't the Passover meal, but it was a meal of the Passover. Uh, and at some point in the meal, Jesus uh, uh, began talking, and he would he would give the the origin and the beginnings of this of this, which it's a, it's a memorial that uh, we often kind of affectionately refer to as the Lord's Supper. Uh, so, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. And again, uh, we know from other writings of Paul that he he at some point went away uh, and spent time directly learning from the Savior. Uh, uh, and then would come back into his ministry. This was very likely done during that time period. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, and the Lord Jesus in the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. That, that's an interesting thing. Uh, if you go all the way back to the John 6 chapter, uh, John 6 passage, where, where Jesus is, is giving a teaching to a group of people who are really just there for free food. He has fed the masses uh, earlier and they just keep following him around and he gives a teaching which to that group was extremely difficult to hear. Uh, for us as Christians all these years later we understand the importance of the Lord's Supper and, and the importance of the, the sacrifice of His body, the, the giving of His blood to bring us a new covenant. We understand the importance. But He would say, if you want to follow Me, you have to eat My flesh. If you want to follow Me, be a part of My kingdom, you have to drink My blood. Boy, something that was just extremely difficult for these, for these individuals here. And most of them would, would subsequently leave. There's really nothing else in the New Testament that, that gives any insight that he clarified what he was talking about until this moment in time when he is now in the upper room with his apostles and he takes a piece of bread and he says, this is my body. Uh, and, and I've often wondered if, if not that was somewhat of a revelation to, to them, oh, that's what he was talking about all those years back when he said, you have to eat my flesh, you have to drink my blood. Uh, so it, it's, it's interesting to, to kind of speculate and try to understand that clearly. But at, at this particular part, Jesus takes a piece of bread, breaks it and says, this is my body. And listen to what else he said. This is my body, which is for you. I mean, a sacrifice that Jesus made by giving his body on the cross. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, an important component of, of the Lord's Supper is the remembrance component and a reflection component uh, that, that we're getting here from Jesus. Verse 25, In the same way He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. 
new covenant. You know, God has really, with His people, had two covenants down through time. Uh, the original covenant that was made back in the times of Abraham and Moses. Uh, the significance of the new covenant that Jesus made, or it, He introduced through His own blood, and the sacrifice of that really brought us two things that the old covenant never could. Uh, number one, it brought us uh, forgiveness of sin. Uh, before sins were just rolled forward until until you could have an inadequate sacrifice, uh, and then number two, of course, is the is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which we get at the time we're baptized. Now, if you go back to Acts, the second chapter, you learn that. Uh, so this new covenant is is extraordinarily important uh, for us as Christians to, because now we finally, as the people of God, have the opportunity to, to enjoy truly the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, so Jesus is talking about this cup is a new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26 is important because it kind of it kind of tells one of the things that the, the Lord's Supper actually accomplishes for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We do this our entire life, every week, based on Acts the 20th chapter, verse 7. We do this our entire lives, every week, until one of two things happens. Number one, we die, or number two, the Savior comes back. Uh, and it is it's a living sermon. It, it's, it's us proclaiming to other Christians and to the world, I am a believer in Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. And I do this to, to proclaim His death uh, until, until He comes again. Such a, and again, that's kind, of, that's kind of a piece in there that, that we hadn't really got before from Scripture that Paul is, is revealed to us. Then we get to verse 27. Uh, and this somewhat ties in with the uh, the problems that they're having in the Corinthian church regarding the love feast, the agape feast, but it also, in some aspects, it kind of expands the the challenge of the Lord's Supper. That being adequately examining yourself and reflecting on your own weaknesses as you partake. Uh, and boy, as you're going to see as we kind of work through this, it has some extremely eternal consequences of, of participating in the Lord's Supper Feast inappropriately. Uh, almost fearful uh, as, as we go through, which, which we've had a lot of that in, in, in the Corinthian letter. But let's begin, let's begin looking at verse 27. Therefore, so he's been talking about this Lord's Supper, what it is, how we do it, what it's to accomplish, and then he's going to kind of expand on that now. Therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that, that's, the, that's a key to understanding this, in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, what is in view here is not the unworthiness of the participant. I mean, what, is, what is in view here is the unworthiness of the manner with which we partake. And there's a big difference. Uh, Truly, none of us could ever be, in, with, 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 with the exception of having the blood of Jesus wash our sins away, there's none of us that could be worthy as a participant to partake of this feast. I mean, we just couldn't do anything save the blood of Jesus. That's not what's in concept. That's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about is the method by which we partake and participate in the Lord's Supper. And that's, that's an important distinction that we, that we need to make. Cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I mean, that's that is effectively saying we 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 crucify Him again, uh, and it's it's a very pointed passage, and He's going to expand on that. But and, and here here's where He's clarifying this idea that it's 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 not the participant, but the worthiness. Of, of, of the manner with which we partake. He clarifies that in verse 28. But a man must examine himself. We must have a, a rigorous self-examination. Self For me personally, uh, in, it is my goal on, a, on, a, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday morning, when I get up early, I begin this process of preparing my mind. The, the, the Lord's Supper is the central ordinance of our worship service. It is the central focus of our worship service. And you can begin to prepare early, and then when you get to church, and then as you begin your, your final thought process of reflecting on yourself, 
acknowledging your sins, acknowledging your shortcomings, and praying for forgiveness and for assistance. I mean, all of these things are a part of a self-examination. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So it's, I think what we would say here is we're not going to do anything flippant, and we're not going to do anything kind of rash or just carelessly. Uh, th this, this requires thought. It requires focus, and it requires, a, again, a rigorous self-examination of our own lives as, as, we, as we partake together. Very important. And then Paul kind of gives, he kind of begins to talk about the impact of doing it improperly in verse 29. For he who eats and drinks, and that would be participates in the Lord's Supper by eating the, eating the bread, which is an emblem of his body, drinking the cup, which is an emblem of his blood. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Now, now that takes it to this almost an entirely different level now of, of the, the danger of improperly participating in the Lord's Supper. Uh, it, is, it is something that absolutely necessitates focus and necessitates reflection, it necessitates examination and, and preparedness as, as we do this. It's not flippant. It's not, it's not just as, as, the, as the tray comes past, taking an emblem and then passing it on down and then going back to your, your, your carnal thoughts, whatever they may be. It is a moment in time for just, just a few minutes that we are singularly focused on the Savior, singularly focused on His sacrifice, singularly focused on the gifts that He has given us of salvation. Uh, so very important. And the word that He sticks in there, it's powerful. Judgment, I, condemnation, damnation. Uh, those, those, are, uh, those are truly fearful thoughts that we have as Christians about could we, through our own carelessness, do something that, 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 that endangers our salvation. Boy, listen, listen to the way he continues on with this discussion in verse 30. For this reason, and, and what he's talking about is people who have improperly partaken of the Lord's Supper. For this reason, many among you, many, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Now what he's referencing there is not something physical. You're not physically ill. You're not physically sick. You're spiritually sick. You're spiritually weakened. And up to the point where some have actually died spiritually to, to God. Uh, what a dangerous thought. What, a, what an indicator that participation in the Lord's Supper properly is as, as a reflection of your relationship with the Father. So very important. So very, uh, so, so much a, a requirement for us to make certain that each week, week in, week out, we spend the proper time getting our minds prepared and ready to examine ourselves as we partake uh, because wow this is this is uh, this is powerful for this reason many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep spiritually have lost their salvation wow but and again he's he he, he talks about the the, the, the the negative piece with the, the eternal consequences that it has and then he's going to give us a caveat here but verse 31. If we judged ourselves rightly, and that goes right back up to verse 28 where he says, but a man must examine himself. If we had judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. I mean, if, if, if we, there's nothing to be concerned about as we partake of the Lord's Supper if we, are, if we are getting ourselves in the proper mindset, the proper focused attitude, the proper mindset of, of examining my own life and being prepared. Uh, if we had judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, and this is important because this, this tells us the purpose for which God is judging us with, 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 with a spiritual weakness, uh, with, with the challenges that, that, that he's talking about here. It's so that we won't be lost with the rest of the world. We will remain in a good covenant relationship with God, which Jesus has brought us. Now listen to what he says here in verse 30 to 32. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful piece of scripture, isn't it? This is something that God does to help us remain 
in a good relationship with Him and, and, and be disciplined so that we won't lose our soul. Uh, it, it, is, it is such a powerful, and, and again, you can kind of see why this teaching is so, is so important to us as Christians as we try to understand the Lord's Supper, as we try to understand what it is it's about, because again, the Gospels just, they have the historical side, but they don't have this depth of understanding, this depth of warning, and this depth of, of clarity as to what the Lord's Supper represents. So it's an important piece of Scripture. Now, so we've gotten down through verse 32. Keep in mind, we started in verse 17 talking about problems in the Lord's Supper, uh, specifically at the church in Corinth with, with regards to the agape or the love feast. Then he kind of takes this sidebar and talks a little bit in detail about the Lord's Supper. So in verse 33 and 34, he's coming back to his original discussion, which kind of ended in verse 22. So again, this is pretty classic of, of Paul's teaching where he'll be teaching on something and he'll go teach on something else and then he'll kind of revert back and that's what's happening. So in verse 33, so then, I mean, kind of summarizing what he had earlier taught. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. I mean, this, this is a teaching that goes back where these Christians were, they were coming in and they were, some were eating over here, some were eating over here, some weren't eating at all. They weren't partaking of the Lord's Supper together. They weren't jointly and unified with good unity amongst the church there uh, in their partaking of the Lord's Supper. Just a whole group of problems. Paul's saying this is... This, this, this is something that we need to do together as a body, uh, as, a, as a fellowship uh, of believers. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat the Lord's Supper, wait for one another. And here in verse 34 is we, he eventually, I would say, puts the final nail of the coffin uh, on this idea of a love feast and it being associated with the Lord's Supper. Because listen to what he says on verse 34. If anyone is hungry... Okay, you, you, you're, you're looking for a common meal here, something that we do for sustenance, something that we do uh, sometimes for enjoyment, but it, it's, it's something that we just do as, 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 as a part of our, of our human existence. Uh, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. You see how Paul has just separated off this love feast thing this lo from the worship service itself. Now, often in the church today, uh, after services are over, we will get together and have what we refer to as a fellowship meal, or we'll have some kind of dinner together, all different kinds of names for it. That's, that's not what is being talked about here. Those are separate and apart from the worship service and not to be construed. This is something that was a part of their worship program, okay? And Paul is essentially saying, no more. It was abused. It was not effective. It was causing judgment. Uh, and he's going to say that here in just a second. It was causing uh, dissent amongst the amongst the congregation. It was just it was just too problematic to continue. So Paul is effectively discounting that and stopping that for that church and for all churches going forward. We we just don't long we no longer have anything that is regarding a common meal as a part of our worship service. And this is where we get the teaching. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So, and and this is why, so that you will not come together. For judgment. You will not do anything that negatively impacts the central ordinance of our worship service, and that is the Lord's Supper. It is it is paramount, it is it is special in our worship service, and anything that can be done or anything that is done to distract from that is not tolerated. And and I love the way he says, so that you will not come together for judgment. You will not do something that affects your salvation. The remaining matters, I will arrange when I come. And we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, Paul is responding here very likely to some, some type of communication or letter, one might say, that he had received from the church about really just questions. Uh, how do we do this? What's proper here? We're doing this. Is this something we should discontinue or continue, etc.? The difficult thing is we have the answers, but we don't have the questions. <laughs> that's, that's been the challenge of, of understanding this entire book uh, in many cases, whether it was the first six chapters were a letter from the household of Chloe uh, or the, uh, the second, chapter 7 through the remainder of the book where we suppose that there was a letter that was given from what is inferred. 
uh, but we just don't know what was asked and we try to apply it as best as we can to ourselves when we really don't even know what was asked. So it's a challenge. Uh, and the, the Christians there in Corinth were, uh, were abusing uh, some of the things in their relationship with with God and with Christ and, w and with with other churches. So, here here's uh, the what we would call the the end of the of the love feast or the agape feast, which again had become a part of their worship service. Uh, interesting piece of passage. And then Paul says there's some other things that you talked about here regarding this. When I get there, and he's planning on making another trip. When I get there, we'll address those when I come. Let's stop there. Uh, have a prayer. Thank you for taking the time to uh, listen in. I hope it was uh, of some benefit. Uh, these are particularly challenging pieces of Scripture. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for a love of Your Word, a willingness to, to open Your Scriptures and try to understand and try to interpret and try to apply uh, these things are so important in our relationship to our God and to understand the, the great love of our Savior. Let us appreciate, Father, that from this particular passage, the all-importance of the Lord's Supper. It is the time when we remember and we reflect on our Savior and on our own lives as it, as it is in regards to the great love that Jesus had for us to die, to come from heaven and die, something that we cannot even begin to comprehend. May we always show love in our hearts, Father. May we always be the kind of people that are, in some small way, worthy to be called a Christian. We ask these things in the name of, of your Son and our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Amen.